The following message is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. So just a brief prayer. Father, hallow this time, we pray. Guard and guide our comments and our questions, lest, having listened to such careful exposition of James, we immediately fall foul of much of the instruction we've received. May the words of my mouth, our mouths, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. All right, so the microphones are here. If you put up your hand, you have a question or a comment to make, um, then someone will bring the microphone to you, and uh, we'll go from there. If you say your name, incidentally, and where you're from when you, when you speak, that would be terrific. A small and experienced board, and we've asked other pastors and haven't gotten any answers. And the question is, should we be tithing from what we're getting? We have no administrative costs, so we're just we're wondering if we have money now that's not being used. Should we be tithing? All right. I think I, I think I heard you saying that you've got a small congregation and you've got so much money that you're wondering if, as a congregation, you should tithe it. It's a ministry outside the country. To, to, I'm sorry, the ministry is outside the country? Yes, sir. And it generates money to America? No, it, all the money comes to us, and 100% of it goes to India, but we don't, we're just wondering, should we be tithing with it? We're not. No, just send it all to India. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Alistair. Steve from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, you've been in ministry for 30 plus years. If you could uh, go back or speak to the 30 year old version of yourself, what would you say? Hmm. I'd say slow down. Um, Don't be so hortatory, or hortatory, I think, as you say. Um, beware of thinking that uh, you can drive the people, as it were, and um, try, try and try and lead them by example. Try and um, let them know sooner rather than later, that you regard it as a, as a great privilege to have been called to do this, and that you do actually love them. It's possible for you to love them and for them not to know that you do. So however you come up with a way to do that, I would say to myself, make sure you do that a lot sooner than you've ever done that. Um, seek out the counsel of men who have um, impacted your life and whom you respect and trust, and ask them to be very honest with you. Send them a couple of your—I would send them a couple of my sermons and, and bite my fingernails waiting on their reply. Uh, those kinds of things. Um, commit myself to a more diligent prayer life. Uh, uh, be more uh, diligent in, in study. Don't be lazy. Don't hide. Don't try and get by on your wits. All those things. I could go on all night thinking about the things I wish I'd known then. And even when I know them now, it's a matter of doing them, as we saw in James. Um, those kinds of things. Yep. David from Pennsylvania. Uh, what counsel would you give to a young pastor in the delicate issue of uh, discipling older men? Hmm. Well, you know, the, the, issue, the issue in relationship to that, to the age, is an interesting question, isn't it? You know, in, in, in Peter, where, where he's given that directive uh, to them, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. Um, 
And then he goes on uh, to say, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. I, you know, spiritual maturity is not necessarily tied to age, to chronological age. And so, uh, there, there needs to be a measure of humility, I think, on the part of those of us who are older to take lessons from those who are younger. Because in, in, in recognizing the spiritual maturity of some who are younger than us, uh, we, uh, we realize that uh, we, we, we need them and we benefit from them. If we are the younger people giving that uh, uh, advice, um, we have to do it in a way that recognizes that age does have some significance, um, that uh, respect for uh, those who have lived longer is, is something that is a matter that we ought to pay attention to, both within the culture as a whole and, and certainly within the framework of the church. Uh, often when we're young, uh, we, we can um, come across as if we really do know it all, and it's a pity that these old codgers have uh, missed the boat for so long, and they must be absolutely thrilled that we've now shown up so that we can uh, put, put their lives back together again. I mean, it, it does come back to the issue of tone in part, doesn't it, that we were thinking about earlier. So I would say, you know, how do, how do we do it? We do it cautiously. We do it graciously. I would say that we do it, uh, it you know, infrequently. But, um, you know, remember that Spurgeon was, what, tw 20 years old? And just, read, just read the opening of, of Knowing God. And, uh, and the, the, that opening section there is, you know, after Packer says, as, as, as all clowns uh, yearn to play Hamlet, so I have yearned to write a treatise on God. And then, and then he goes immediately to that great piece by, by Spurgeon. Well, Spurgeon could never have pastored the church if, if he was stumbled by the fact that people were older than him, because nearly everybody was older than him. So it's a dance, isn't it, on both sides? Those of us who are older have to be humble enough to recognize that we have, we have people around us uh, who may be more spiritually mature than us, and, uh, or at least as mature, and therefore we're not— uh, we ought not to deprive ourselves of the benefit that God provides by the gifting He's given to those who are younger than ourselves. Okay. Uh, Joe Marzano from uh, West Middlesex, Pennsylvania. Hi. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, we talked earlier in the breakout session about worship. Uh, what input do you have in the worship, uh, in the music selection of the worship service? What input do I have? Yeah, do you have influence in as, it? As much as Ruth allows me. <laughs> sort of, thank you. Um, I actually have quite a lot, more than, more than I think many people in my position would have. Um, I hope not in a heavy-handed way. I hope, I hope in a way that recognizes that um, when we, when we study the passage of Scripture as we're going through the week where we have the responsibility of opening up the text, I find myself just constantly writing down lyrics uh, along the side of my notes. And so, I will often pass those on to Ruth and say, this is not to restrict in any way uh, your, your selection of material, but these are the kind of things I have in mind. And so, I think the honest answer is that the way in which we would frame these uh, services is in a collaborative way. And, but, but we have moved away from the idea of, you know, the pastor being a guest preacher in his own congregation, where uh, the, 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 quotes, minister of worship essentially frames everything and, and, and basically says to the pastor, you have, you know, 27 minutes. And, uh, it's, I, don't, I don't like that, uh, and so we, do, we don't do that. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah from Middletown, Maryland. Um, my question is, I've, I was recommended by several Anglican friends to read N.T. Wright's Surprise by Hope. I did so, and I came away somewhat confused um, by his argument connecting the resurrection to the new heaven and new earth from Revelation being this earth 
here and to get busy in the kingdom of God physically now. Um, I didn't read much about substitutionary atonement in that book, and I'm wondering, was he incorrect or maybe placing an overemphasis on that at the expense of the atonement? How does one, if you've read it or, or are familiar with it, how does one reconcile these things? Because I felt a great emphasis on kingdom at the expense of atonement, and I'm not so sure, maybe I read it wrong, but I, it left me wrestling with that topic. Hmm. I have read that book, and it's some time since I've read it, and so I don't have that clearly in my mind so that I, I can't say, oh, yes, I, rem I, I, I get that. I think that in the stuff that uh, N.T. Wright has done, both on the resurrection and in terms of, uh, of kingdom work, I get the impression that Wright in those sections is seeking to counteract uh, much of the uh, views of uh, heaven being up there and out there and gone and totally unrelated to anything uh, in terms of uh, what, it, what it will mean for a new Jerusalem to come down out of heaven as a city for God. So I think that he is in part, but I can't speak for him, obviously, he's in part reacting to that. The absence I, would, I don't think that he would set uh, notions of his view of the kingdom in, juxtap in, in antithesis to uh, the atonement, but as I say, I can't remember that part of the book. I would say that N.T. Wright, and this is live streamed, I, I, would, say, <laughs> I would say that N.T. Wright, who is, who is clearly brilliant and has um, ended up at St. Andrews University in Scotland, of all places, um, it should be read with caution. And in, in terms of historicity, in terms of the resurrection, in terms of those things, I, I think he's absolutely super. I, I did read him uh, on the section in Colossians uh, that I was uh, uh, rambling around in uh, yesterday, and will continue to ramble for a while in the morning, um, and, and, uh, and, it was and it was very, very helpful. But as to your specific question, read the atonement, I can't give you a better answer. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, I'm Dan from Arizona. Uh, you have been engaged in an, uh, several conversations with Dennis Prager and with Zuni Jasser in Arizona. And I'm wondering uh, how you decide how and when to engage in public forums. What criteria do you use? What is your goal and desire? Obviously, it's a gospel goal. But, um, and what type of parameters do you set on those uh, meetings in order to be able to speak the gospel clearly? Well, thank you. Um, the, the honest answer is that, you know, I'm carried on, uh, Salem, on Salem stations. Those events were both organized by Salem Communications, and they, so the initiative came from them. I had no control over the parameters in either situation at all. And uh, the one in Arizona that perhaps you were more familiar with, uh, with um, the Muslim doctor and, and Dennis, the, the man who moderated that discussion was himself a kind of political gentleman. And so the conversation almost inevitably went in that direction. And I, I, I mean, apart from apart from saying, hey, wait a minute, this is the wrong conversation. Um, I was a guest, and when you're at a guest in that situation, you, you, you don't have the same freedom that you might have if, if you have folks around your own table. In the, in the one most recently at the Reagan Library uh, with Dennis, I, I found that a much easier situation be, because Hugh Hewitt was concerned to ask essentially theological questions of us and therefore he paved the way for, a, for me at least to be able to interact on that level. Um, so I, I suppose I'm saying that the key to it, unless you were just left by yourself, I mean, I wouldn't mind debating somebody like Dennis Prager in a straightforward, you know, Oxford debate, uh, but um, that's not what happens. And so uh, I... I, I, tried, I tried to take uh, my chances as they came 
I forgot some things, like, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I, I couldn't bring up the psalm in my mind in the heat of the moment, and uh, people were very quick to tell me afterwards. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah. Okay, we done? I'm right, right here. Oh, sorry. Hi, Josh from Middlefield, Ohio. Um, yesterday evening, you, on preaching on Him we, we Proclaim, you mentioned the need to have a reputation of faithfulness to Scripture over uh, faithfulness to a doctrinal position. And so I'm wondering, by what standard do we determine whether we're doing that when we're preaching a text that lends itself to a particular doctrinal position uh, that may be more or less fundamental to the faith? like a text on great, uh, salvation by grace alone through faith alone, or a text that may reference particular atonement. Okay, that's good. Um, I, think what, I think what I was saying was that it is more important to be known for faithfulness to the Scriptures than faithfulness to a particular theological perspective. I was not saying that a theological perspective is unimportant, nor was I trying to deny my own theological perspective. But what I was saying was what I was saying, and that is, <laughs> I would like, I would, I, 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 the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. So, th there are certain things that are absolutely foundational to us within the, within the framework of faith. There are, there are other things that uh, we may, for example, a view of eschatology, we may have divergent views on. We're both agreed, we're all agreed, that uh, Jesus Christ will return in power and in glory. Once we get to the issues of exactly when and so on, then we might uh, go at it in different ways. So, to your point, I think what we do is we preach the text of Scripture. We preach the Scriptures as they're given. So, for example, uh, if we're dealing with 1 Timothy 2, I think it's 1 Timothy 2. Uh, now I have to, well, you could check. I think it's 1 Timothy 2. They, <laughs> that, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? So, 1 Peter 2? 2 Peter 3 9? I got to look up 1 Timothy 2 because I don't know why I have it in my mind. No, it's not 2 Timothy 2 2. But hang on. Are you still there, questioner? I'm just conf I want to make sure what I'm talking about myself. Yeah, it's, I, it's 1 Timothy 2 4. Who's the bright spark down here? <laughs> this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. If I misquoted it, I apologize, but that's the verse that I had in my mind, which is 1 Timothy 2 4. <clears throat> So, when we teach 1 Timothy 2.4, we teach 1 Timothy 2.4. We, we don't have to squeeze around in it and wriggle around. It says what it says, and it means what it says. Right? But so, what it points up is the difference between the fundamental willingness of God and the universality of the gospel appeal and the secret decree of God whereby in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the things that are secret belong to the Lord our God, and they haven't been made known to us. The things that He wants us to know, we know, and in that great mystery, there is a mystery. Some of us want immediately to correct the Bible, lest in case somebody thinks that we don't hold to the proper view. I don't care if you think I've got the wrong view. I'm just going to teach the text for now. And if you teach the Bible— Eventually, as you teach through the Bible, unless you, and if you teach it with a big F and a small T, then you will teach your framework all the time from the text. If you teach it with a big T for text and a small F for framework, then the text will dictate your exposition and your delivery. It doesn't mean that we are just a walking contradiction, but it does mean that there will be times when people listen to us preach, and they'll think, I think our pastor has, has, has had some kind of charismatic experience, <laughs> apart from all the things he's talking about now. 
And I think our pastor is a raving, um, or just a raving. Just I think our pastor's <laughs> raving. Is, is that enough on that? Did I, conf- did I confuse the issue with that? Thank you. I did confuse the issue. Yeah, okay. <laughs> ah. Successful. Uh, Daniel, Lusby, Maryland. Uh, so I'm a youth pastor, um, and I have this group of kids that's been coming to my youth group that they just, they're just they in the neighborhood close by, and they walk to the youth group. But the problem is when they get there, they're usually there just to play basketball, and they're generally disrespectful to me and my leaders and don't follow the rules or anything like that. They become a problem uh, for my other students. So my question to you, and this is something I've really been wrestling with, is when does evangelism stop? and protecting my other students start? Um, well, evangelism never stops, and protecting your students shouldn't stop either. So we, I'd see you have a dilemma. What are we going to do? <laughs> I think the, the rowdies, we'd beat them with a stick. And then, and, then, and then we'll just take it from there. <laughs> no, I, I, I get it entirely, because I, as, you, as you say that, I remember a fascinating evening in my life when I was young. Um, it was a long time ago now, and I was in, I was in Stockton on Tees in the, in the northeast of England. Myself and two friends, we had a singing group. They could sing. I was just making up the, making up the numbers. But when we began to do our presentation in a youth context like that, we were into into a couple of our songs, and the back doors opened, and a bunch of of bikers came in. And they, they obviously had seen the cars or something, and in through the doors they came. And um, they made their presence felt immediately. I remember uh, we had some kind of song that was like— I don't know what it was, but they didn't like it that much. And they began, they began to make a sound like, a, like the howling of a wolf in the middle of it. So my friend singing like, you know, um, teach me thy way, O Lord, and they're going, oh! Just, just, <laughs> and I, I thought it was so funny, and I was supposed to be concerned. I'm like, man, this... This is one of the best nights I've ever had, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then, like an idiot, I say, hey, you guys up there, if you think you can do better than this, why don't you come up here? That was not a good thing to say. <laughs> because they came up. <laughs> and they eventually had to call the police to clear the, clear the place. So I want to take seriously your question. <laughs> When you organize something, you have every right to say, these, this is the framework, these are the parameters. And I think there is a way to do it. I think there is a way to make sure that uh, uh, they, they, they feel a genuine sense of welcome. And that, uh, that, but if, if we're going to enjoy the activities up front of basketball and stuff like that, then when we get to the point of the talk, we can appeal to their sensibility if it exists. And if they can't, then we can just just tell them, you know, it's, clear, it's pretty clear that you're not ready for, the, for, for this talk, and you should probably drift off now before I beat you with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. That's a joke. This. Yeah. Good evening, Alistair. Patrick Abbott from Frederick, Maryland. And my question is also musically related. I know from having listened to you for many years, that you are a big fan of Paul Simons. And I've also noticed in his recent tour that he has begun to wear a cross. And I've wondered if you have ever gotten the chance to meet this man and speak to him. No, no, I haven't. I, would, I, I, truly, I truly would love to. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I haven't. I could tell you more along those lines, but it would be an embarrassment to my wife. And you know how I don't like to do that. Um, (laughs) 
in, uh, in, 19, in 1974, uh, Paul Simon uh, played at the Royal Albert Hall uh, in London with uh, Uru Bamba. And uh, I was there with a few of my friends from LBC, and we decided that uh, we should corner him as, as, he, leave, as he left, and uh, we would choose one of our group to, to, give him, to give him a copy of the gospel. And uh, so um, Mandy, the, 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 one of my friends who uh, is now at, actually at, Regent, at Regent's College, he worked for the BBC for a while, a Welsh guy, um, she, was, she was the prettiest of the group. <clears throat> I was second, but she... Um, <laughs> Uh, and so, so we, we, we said to her, Mandy, you're the best shot we've got, you know? And he, he came out of the door and out of the side, and, and she stepped forward and she said, Paul, uh, I, I have here a, a, a gospel and, and uh, an explanation of the gospel, and I, would, and I would like you to have it. And very kindly, he took it from her. He looked at it. He said, thank you, and uh, I will read it. And um, I guess he did. Now, I was, I, I was in New Orleans and in Los Angeles for his, for his final thing. So, I, yes, I am a, a big fan. Both of those things were birthday gifts to me, as it turns out. So, you don't think I was violating James again this evening. So. <clears throat> But here's, here, here's a quick story that, that, you, that you may or may not know. Um, David Brooks' new book, which is just out, in which he describes himself now—David Brooks, the New York uh, columnist—he describes himself now as a wandering Jew and a confused Christian. Um, Brooks was introduced to John Stott by Michael Cromarty, who died last year. Michael Cromarty said to David Brooks, why do you keep using the, uh, the, uh, Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell as your go-to guys when you are referencing evangelicalism? Brooks said, well, who else should I use? Cromarty said, if evangelicals were to uh, uh, create, have a pulp, the pulp would be John Stott. So, Brooks then wrote an article, I think in 2004, entitled—and you can find this in the New York Times—entitled, Who is John Stott? And he had gone out and he bought Christian Mission to the Modern World. He bought Basic Christianity. He read about five of Stott's books, and he wrote this column. And, and I just heard Brooks interviewed in the last few days on the Gospel Coalition website. You can find it. And when Colin Hansen pressed him on where he was with things and what what was the genesis of the, the, the turning point for him? He traced it to his meeting, his subsequent meeting, with John Stott. And he said that he was struck not, first of all, by the brilliance of Stott, but by the kindness of him and by his willingness to entertain his questions. Now, here's the little bit I'm getting to, because you're going, well, that's very interesting, but I didn't ask you anything about that. <laughs> This, this, this is to me from, De, from Michael Cromarty, who's, who's now gone to heaven. Cromarty told me that Paul Simon was in London, staying at the Dorchester. He gets the New York Times. He reads the article written by Brooks about John Stott. He calls back to America and says to his management, can you find a way for me to meet this man, John Stott? They then created a, a point of entry. This is, this, is from, this is from Simon to Brooks to Cromarty to Begg. He, he then called John Stott and invited him to come for dinner to dinner at the Dorchester with him. Stott, he said, no, thank you. But if you would like to come to my flat, you can come to my flat. Paul Simon apparently went to the flat, Stott welcomed him in, and, and Stott said that he was immediately sort of belligerent. He was, very, he was provocative. 
And so John had said to him, you know, Paul, I don't think this is going to be a profitable conversation. Why don't we spend the time that we have at our disposal addressing the question, is Jesus Christ the person he claimed to be? And Paul Simon was then under the tutelage of Stott in that situation, in that time. Subsequently, back in America, all that he said was, I would like to find other people like that man. Now, he may have a cross around his neck. I think he's just covering all his bases. But his, when he gets to the preaching part of, it, of his show, which he, which he does, it's um, save the whales, save the planet, because there's nothing else for us. We've got to fix the place for the generations to come. To, 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 people said, did you enjoy being at the thing? I said, half of me was thrilled, and the other half of me wanted to burst into tears because he is a clever, wonderful, amazing little Jewish man, lyricist, by his own testimony, without God and without hope in the world. So, yeah, if you can arrange for us to meet, we'll do it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yep. Yeah, sir, my name is Guy Giordano. I'm from Harding, Pennsylvania. Thank you for a great conference. Um, my question is this. Um, how much of your ministry would you say was orchestrated by you and your team, and how much of the ministry was orchestrated by God that took you by surprise? Oh. <laughs> when you say or, uh, your ministry, what, do you, what are you referring to? The ministry that God entrusted you with. Okay. Well, I, I, my understanding of it is that God is, uh, that uh, God is providentially at work in, in all of these things, that uh, a man's heart devises his, his way, but the Lord directs his steps, that uh, everything is upheld by his providential hand. Um, but God doesn't, work, God doesn't work in a vacuum. You know, he works through history and geography and people and circumstances. And so, uh, almost in, in much the same way that uh, in that verse, uh, the closing verse of, of Colossians 1, you know, Paul, Paul says, and, and, I, and, and I, I'm toiling and I'm struggling with all the energy that God provides. So, he doesn't—the energy that God provides is—the provi provision is made within the context of his toiling and his struggling. So the two, the things are in opposition to one another. They're not, not in opposition to one another. Uh, I'm not. I'm not aware of. I'm not aware of uh, being the being the product of clever imagination on the part of our team here. Um, and and indeed, I think in most instances we've tried always to be. Um, in a, res in a responding mode to initiatives rather than being the ones who are cre creating the initiative, especially when it comes to the advancement of things, um, so that we're, we're, we're not cherishing any illusions or bright ideas about, you know, why we would be on the radio. You know, we didn't, we, we're on the radio because they asked us to go on the radio. And when they asked us at the beginning, we, we, we said, no, we shouldn't, or we went on one station. Um, so hopefully the two things are— hopefully we're, we're responding to the, to the leading of God. Certainly I hope I didn't get it wrong, because I've been here for 36 years, you know. <laughs> That's a long time to be gone from Scotland. Uh, Aaron from Auburn Hills, Michigan. Um, in light of today's political climate in which um, morality is blatantly disregarded, in which um, freedom of religion is restricted, and uh, just holding a biblical opinion is even considered violence to uh, express it, is it ever um, appropriate to address politics explicitly from the pulpit? Is it ever, is it ever appropriate to address politics explicitly from the pulpit? Um, well, I think the answer to that would be yes. Um, again, if we're going to allow the Scriptures to, to direct us, 
if we work our way through Scripture, we're going to come up against certain, certain things. I mean, obvious things um, in Romans or in Timothy, where it addresses those things. But if you're really asking questions like, um, uh, what, what, what are we going to— what would our political stance be on, on X? I'm very, very leery of that, not because I don't have a, don't, not because I don't have a political view or, or think that it might be worthwhile saying, but I don't want to, I don't want to allow a political um, perspective to become a point of division within my own congregation. And so, uh, to, the ex- to the extent that we can agree on, particularly, let's say, in, in certain moral areas, the, the, the issue of abortion or whatever it might be. I mean, that, that, that crosses all party divides. But uh, there are some pretty fierce uh, views that abound in relationship to the present. Um, and I have actually pretty strong views on that. So, I actually con- constrain myself and control myself. I mean, I'm, I'm mad on Brexit. I mean, I just am so— I, I've had to— I'm, I just, every morning when I wake up, I go, oh, I can't believe these people, you know. And so, then I realize, no, I'm becoming angry, and that's that. This doesn't work the righteousness of God. That's in James as well, isn't it? I mean, I can't get out of this James thing tonight. It's just, it's just why did you do that? One-on-one, I might be more honest. Yeah. Or, or, or no, not, not more honest, but, but maybe more specific. Yeah. Hi there. Um, my name— Oh. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> Who's on first? Hi. I'm Kyle. I'm from uh, the Youngstown area. Um, I'm actually in an apprenticeship program right now, a two-year apprenticeship. And so I'm wondering if there's any uh, encouragement and challenge that you can give to me during this season of my life. Oh. Well, it'd probably be along the lines of the first question, if I remember it correctly. But this, uh, are you single? No, I'm married. You're married. Okay. Well, I was going to say, if you were single, then you know you've got more time now than you're ever going to have in your life. <laughs> and uh, so this is an opportunity now to start to— uh, uh, to build a library and to and to and to read, um, and I suppose I would just say that you know where you have these uh, pockets of opportunity, then to just just seize uh, every every chance you have to um, come to the basics conference or do some, do, but really just just use the time, um, read. Uh, Read, listen, ask. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have anything specific for you at all, quite honestly. Um, I, I, you know, we are what we read, and if you're not a reader, then you start being a good reader. If you if if you are reading, then start indexing your books, and start a catalog uh, some way. If you're a techie person, then get it. You know in your techie world. If you're like bits of paper and files like I am, then you just start that. You can never start, you can never start too soon, because once you've read three books, uh, or in some cases only two books, some of us only one book, we can't remember where it was. And once you get beyond a certain distance, you can spend a tremendous amount of time in a week. I mean, I was looking for a quote today that I knew was in the book. I went back and through the book three times before I found it, and it was because the particular copy of the book that I was using was not a book that I had actually indexed. Um, so, those kind of things. Hello, Alistair. My name is Michael Duncan. I'm from Ocean Shores, Washington. And I may be kind of at the back of the bus on this one, but something has come up in my church called the Hyper Grace Movement. And I was wondering if you're familiar with that. Um, and what are your thoughts on the Hyper Grace Movement, and how have you dealt with it? Um, if you've encountered that. I have not encountered that. Maybe my colleagues have. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not aware. I mean, I, I can take a stab at what it probably is, well, but— from, from but, what I've read, it's based on antinomianism. Okay. All right. And so, what do you mean it's—how it, it, how is it manifesting itself? 
uh, it's coming across as um, that the 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 requirements of the law, the the fulfillment of the law is, uh, is the law is rescinded. That you can basically, by God's grace, accomplish anything in your life, do everything you want, um, approach life without any sense of moral obligation to God because you're under grace. Yeah. Um, get. Um, get Sinclair Ferguson's book, Devoted to God, and it will be as helpful as anything uh, along, these, along these lines, because he does, he does a masterful job about explaining the way in which, although we are no longer under the law as a means of justification, uh, the law remains for us in terms of our sanctification. And when and God does not justify those whom he does not sanctify. And, uh, and so, you have every reason to be very, very uh, concerned about that and not to give anyone who's propounding these things any place of influence in your church, and certainly not to allow them to teach classes or anything like that at all for the well-being of your people. We have seven minutes left. Uh, Ryan from Worcester, Ohio. Um, You've spoken in the past about uh, more or less fighting for fully supporting missionaries. Um, in my church context, less than 150. How do we how do we grow into that, or how do we start that if that's what we want to go towards, but we just don't have the the funds? Right. Well, I I recognize that that that. The position, the, well, where we started from on it was that uh, Kep, um, whom you might have met, who's been a career missionary now down in Bolivia for all these years, was the youth pastor when I came here. He was the youth pastor from, I think, about 81 till 85 or 86. And when time came uh, for Kep to, uh, to leave us and uh, to go to his assignment there, I don't want to be unkind to any of the elders that are still around, but we were about to go into the standard format, which is uh, Kep and his wife are now going to have to get a projector and a bunch of slides and start running around the country and looking for money. And th then it occurred to us, we said, but wait a minute, he was, he was a salaried person as our youth pastor. I mean, if, if, if you paid a guy to hang around here, why wouldn't you support him to go down there? And so basically it was easy because we just transferred the, the resources in that way and then went on from there. And then that became, that became a pattern for us. The simple answer to your question is that a local church can only do what it can do. And therefore, it, it, in your kind of environment, they're probably not able to do that. And so ideally though, what, what, we, what I would encourage you to do is to partner with other congregations who are like-minded, rather than just sending off the person to go and find people. So, better that you call someone that you're in partnership with in terms of gospel ministry and say, you know, I've got Joe and Mary here. They're, they've got a clear call. We're able to support them X. It would be a wonderful thing if, if you would do that too, so that, it, so that there would be that kind of uh, cohesion and so on. And, and, and then just uh, to build it from there. It's the same way in terms of church planting. I mean, our guys that are planting churches are very fortunate insofar as because of God's generosity to us as a congregation, we're able to undergird them. Many fellows who are out there in church planting, because I meet them in my travels, uh, they, they've got to go all over the place trying to look for money to try and uh, plant a church. So, I, what I'm concerned about in these things is the primacy of the local church so that the local church is the sending agency and the missionary organization is the conduit. So the missionary organization does not dictate to the church. The church dictates to the missionary organization. I use dictate um, guardedly in the sense that the missionary organization says, now, uh, when Joe and Mary come home, uh, they're going to be uh, roaming the country for two months. <laughs> we say, no, they're not. They say, well, and, and so that, again, that's where money talks, if you like. See? So, there are missionaries. We sent them. We couldn't do what we do apart from you conduit, but you can't control them because they were sent, sent by God through us. 
So that's the thing. It's, it's, not, it's not just an issue of finance. It's an issue of the philosophy of the sending unit of the church. One last question, maybe. Yes? Hi, my name is David, and I'm from Rochester, New York. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share perhaps a time you've been in the ministry as a pastor for 36 years, that you were really challenged and maybe went through a season of discouragement and how you navigated through that season. I know that the Lord is our helper, but kind of how you, you know, flesh it out, like the details. How did you navigate through that? Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of relationships or um, church congregational life, I... God has protected me, I think, beyond uh, my deserving. Um, and so I'd have, to, I'd have to search to find a season. Let me put it that way. There have been uh, challenges, like I was sharing with Matt Boswell today, that when I decided that the choir should go on vacation for the rest of their lives, um, <laughs> that— that did not go over well. And so that was a little bit of a season. How did I navigate that? Uh, with the help of my colleagues, mainly Jeff Mills, <laughs> where I said, get up there and take care of that, Jeff. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he did. Um, um, I, brother, I really, I don't, I don't, I don't want to try and invent something. God, Somebody said, there's a, such a happy tone in this conference, they said to me this evening. And I said, you know, I, I, I think I know why. It is, it is because of the unanimity of the leadership of this church. You know, when you, when you go into a home, you can tell if, if, if the mom and dad are not talking, if, the, if, the, if it's gone all wonky with the kids. I mean, even, even if you're a visitor for a meal for the evening, you get the vibe. You go into another home, you can tell these people are in harmony with one another. You know, you can't fake this stuff when, when you bring multitudes of people in here. You can you test the waters. Ask any of these folks. Press any of my colleagues and try and get them to, to you know, to, to, to turn it up in some way that says, yeah, but, or whatever else it is. And that's not because they, they, they don't think for themselves or minds of themselves. It is because in the goodness of God, He's given us a wonderful spirit, both on our pastoral team and in the extended team of our lay leadership that actually runs right through. Look at the servanthood of these people in this place for these days. It's unbelievable. You can't, you, you can't buy that. You can't. You can't. And so, um, what are the biggest challenges and seasons I've gone through? I haven't gone through seasons of deep doubt. I, I, I've gone through times in my life where I'm really, really tired, and when you get tired, you get really more crotchety than you are usually, and then you're a pain in the, to your, to your uh, wife and, and, and everybody else around you. I, 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 I agonize over my children, over their well-being, over their, over their spiritual welfare, Nothing keeps me on my knees more than that. And cancer, you know, 12 years ago or whatever it was, that's a little bit of a bump on the way, but nothing to, nothing to knock your wheels off. Um, no, I have to say to you, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I wouldn't trade places with anyone anywhere in the entire world that I've ever been to be involved in ministry. I come back to this pulpit with a sense of unique privilege. And I know that one day when I come back, I won't be able to—that my key won't open the bathroom door, and it will be over. <laughs> Hopefully, someone will give me the foreknowledge of that so that I don't have the embarrassment of it. But until that day dawns, you know, we, we, we soldier on and uh, soldier on. 
Father, thank you so much for these men. How humbling it is for me, Lord, to stand up here as if I know the answers to the questions. Lord Jesus, you have all the answers. And so we commit ourselves afresh to you this night. Thank you for your word to us today in all kinds of ways, not just from the pulpit here, but in interpersonal conversation, the smiles, the prayers, the encouragements, everything. <laughs> we thank you for it all, Lord, for all that it represents of the wonderful, joyful reality of uh, Christian fellowship. We can only imagine how fantastic it was being with the disciples and Jesus. What a shame we've got them all in funny clothes and pictures as if somehow or another they were unreal. Surely they joked with one another. Surely they saw the funny side of things. Surely uh, they sought to encourage each other. Quiet, Peter. Why are you always asking? Philip, we're just like that. Thank you for our wives. Thank you for the children you give us. Thank you for the fact that we can work while it is day, because the night comes when no one can work. Bless, Lord, all who have asked these questions. Help none of them to be offended by my responses. And uh, we look away from ourselves again to you and commit the night to you and the new day when it dawns. Watch over our loved ones where they are. Forgive our sins. Keep us on track. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.